Good morning. Dear participants of the second international workshop on skills and competencies of the 21st century workshop. You are most welcome to, to attend uh, this workshop, which is held both um, online and on campus in, in the hybrid way. Um, dear keynote speakers, uh, dear other participants, um, my name is um, Maya Kuiri. I'm the Director for Study and International Affairs of uh, LUT University. And uh, I'm uh, greatly honored uh, to be able to say you a few welcoming words from the LUT University side and uh, welcome you present in this great um, workshop, which is um, meant for um, learning, uh, getting to know to new um, views, sharing ideas and uh, getting inspired uh, with colleagues from um, different uh, stakeholders. It is so great uh, that the digital technologies allows us to meet uh, during these uh, difficult times and, and um, connect us uh, despite our uh, physical locations. However, I, I wish that next time we will be able to gather together to the same place to get known a bit more in depth to, to each other to, to um, meet in also um, informally and um, get, get friends um, for the future. Joint education programs are a big driver and uh, they, provide, they um, provide a great, great opportunity to educate workforce of the future for the needs of um, industry and uh, other companies. I value, and I know that um, many value them highly, because they put not only universities to work together, but they put universities to work together with students and industry and um, other uh, entrepreneurs who need skilled workforce to build a, a bright and uh, um, future um, in, in many terms. These kind of programs not only provide the uh, formal science-based education in the engineering, in entrepreneurial skills, but uh, they also provide a vast opportunity uh, to uh, create skills in internationalization, team um, playing, and thinking big. They combine people and different stakeholders uh, from uh, many different backgrounds, cultures, countries, um, and, and, and so on. Um, these kind of joint programs are a good example of, of deep and um, successful cooperation in which universities and industry work together. Uh, joint programs connect people in a unique way and, and they um, give the uh, vast unique opportunity to um, not only get the strong substance knowledge provided by the different um, universities, but um, and and the formal education from the program, but also soft skills, teamwork, as I already mentioned, purpose, speaking um, and and working together with people. And these kind of sk soft skills are all definitely needed in the. Um, in the future for different kind of works and jobs, no matter where we are working. And um, the study time that we are now providing for the students, it's also not only about studying, it's also much about making friends, creating networks, um, making your future contacts for not only for the studying, 
and learning, but also for the future working time. Studying is all, hopefully also about having fun, uh, enjoying the atmosphere and friendship and all the skills and knowledge you will be getting. Not only uh, from the educators, the distinguished uh, teachers, professors, other stakeholders, but the fellow students as well. Um, I wish you all enjoy this workshop, the formal program, the insights that the keynote speakers will provide you. I hope they will get you inspired and, and you will have the uh, opportunity to have fruitful discussions and get new ideas um, for the benefit of all of us and how we can develop um, our cooperation and uh, these kind of joint programs for the benefit of students, industry who will get the workforce and also for the participating um, universities. Um, with these words, I, I wish you a, a fruitful um, workshop and um, I will be, I hope that um, uh, you will be having good discussions both online and on, on campus. And um, welcome to LUT. Uh, let's hope we will meet next time um, on, the, on the campus if, if possible. Good morning to all. My name is Juan Herrera. I'm coming from Madrid, from the Technical University of Madrid, where I teach mining engineering. My function here in this uh, workshop will be trying to explain to all of you which is the object of this master program and at the end, why we create this kind of workshop during uh, the, the development of the master program. The reality is that we live in a world that is an been submitted to a many change. Digitalization is changing all the shape of how industries produce, how consumers demand. Everything around us has changed and is changing in a really, really fast path. Mining industry is not, is, uh, we could say, di a different business, but is, uh, the, this change also affects mining industry. And today mining's are, mines are entering a new area where digitalization is showing the hardest part of the, of the evolution. Factors like uh, the increase of the population, the digitalization, decarbonization, and the diversifications of the amount and the quantity of raw materials that are needed are making that mining is entering in a new era. But at the same time, mines must uh, resolve the same aspects and the same problems they were facing uh, years ago. Declining ores, the environmental uh, regulations, complex processes, safety, etc. must be resolved but at the same time, the mines of the future, we are sure that will be carbon free, absolutely digital and autonomous. So this means that the mines of the future will be connected, increasing safety, increasing production, in changing the way they produce. Today it's common, very common to hear, to hear about artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, IoT, cloud computing, dynamic simulation, many words, augmented reality, virtual reality in mining processes, many words that didn't exist a few years ago, 
in the mining sector, now are common words used in the mining sector. So the question is that mining companies, we think that need to have staffs that are able to work with these uh, concepts and transform these technologies in a, a competitive advantage for the business process. That is why we created Mayteam. Mayteam, uh, uh, as a word, is the common idea of nine partners with this common objective of creating a new master program, but a common objective that we think must be open to the future because the change is constant. Mayteam, uh, the Mayteam project will be uh, is the project to develop a master program where we will train a new generation of engineers that are able to take these innovations and these new technologies, integrate them in a feasible business solution and create added value in the raw materials industry. For this, uh, we could say that in education, uh, everything has been discovered. The reality is not that. The reality is that, sorry, is that uh, we need to join uh, uh, students as customers of these master programs, but we need also to hear industry. This is why we created these uh, workshops, like this second workshop that we are having this year, to bring together industries, lecturers, and especially students, because the new master program has to uh, be developed in a new reality, and we need to approach the, all the different uh, points of view. This is the reason behind this kind of uh, activities, and I really hope that uh, all of us will be able to enjoy this experience and the most important, uh, at least for me, to learn about others, about what is the industry that we are facing in the next years. So uh, I hope you will enjoy this event and thank you very much for, for your attention. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Magdalena Worsakozak, and I'm a MATIM leader at Wrocław University of Science and Technology. Uh, today, my honor is to present you the keynote speaker, but first, one thank you for introducing us to the MATIM project, it, uh, it aims uh, and objectives. The role of this workshop is to support the project team in developing the most promising and uh, possible the best study program that meets the challenges of the future. And for this very reason, today uh, we are hosting two exceptional women and one outstanding man. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce uh, the first, Beata Staszków, who is president of the management board of the Polish Copper Employees Association. Uh, Beata will share with us uh, her expertise on managers of the future in mining industry. Uh, as the second will speak Fabio Ferry, uh, Education Manager at AIT Raw Materials Innovation Hub South, uh, who will show us the opportunities offered by AIT Raw Materials Academy programs in acquiring key competences. And finally, Sol Villar, Senior Vice President of Organization and Human Resources at Atlantic Copper. Uh, Sol will give us insight to human resources challenges in the mining industry on 21st century. Beata, Fabio, 
and Sol, the floor is yours. Okay, Beata, you can start. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's uh, really amazing to be uh, labeled as outstanding. I'm, I'm very honored to be invited to uh, give a short presentation of uh, my experience as regards managing um, uh, an employer's organization, but also um, I would like to dwell on my expertise as a career consultant, business mentor, and I hope uh, this presentation uh, will uh, show a little bit of a light on what the industry is expecting from future graduates. Uh, I come from uh, a very modest background and my expertise lies in um the uh, in first of all in in uh higher education um for for many for for 20 years i've been working in in higher education uh, basically with with educational startups uh, I also worked as a career management consultant and trainer. Therefore, I gathered experience which hopefully will help you to uh, see what is important for business and how you can navigate your careers and how you can build your uh, programs in order to cater for employees' needs. First of all, uh, I introduced my organization. Uh, for five years, I've been uh, working uh, for Polish Copper Employees Association, which, which was established by KJHM uh, Polish Copper. And in the beginning uh, was uh, to cater for the, the managers' needs of this capital group. However, from 1997, we started to, uh, um, to invite uh, SMEs, uh, local governments, uh, and, and, and small and medium-sized businesses to ensure that they are profiting from, uh, from, from, from the expertise of a big copper conglomerate in the region. As an organization, we also uh, we are members of the two Polish organizations working uh, to uh, ensure that the Polish law is business friendly. Um, at the moment, we have um, more than we have about 122 members. Out of them, 44 represent uh, industrial companies. Uh, 15 companies represent uh, business services, and we've got 24 municipal and public sector companies, four SMEs, as well as four uh, members of academia. Uh, the, the, the sectors that we, uh, uh, who, 
that represent um, our member organization is mining, metallurgy, industrial processing, transport, research, trade, uh, tourism, health sector, financial, etc. So uh, 11 members uh, belong to KJHM and its divisions. 24 members is KJHM's capital group. Uh, 24 local government units and municipal companies and uh, medium-sized uh, enterprises, cut a 463 uh, of our members. That allows us to build uh, some sort of a, a micro, uh, a micro uh, ecosystem, which uh, where we we feel very responsible for how our member companies develop. Now, as you might have noticed, many of our organizations are are related to. Uh, mining and 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 copper smelting and uh, metallurgical sector. Therefore, we have a very close we have very close insights for uh, as regards what this industry sector needs. Uh, previous speakers talk, talked about challenges that have been that the, the mining uh, organizations, mining companies have been facing since. Uh, the, the, the COVID-19 uh, and, and, and due to digital transformation. And obviously we can notice that as well. Many of our companies needed to change the way they operate, okay? Uh, many organizations um, mechanized their operations. They started using robots, they started using sensors, they started to um, use hybrid work, which was very much uh, or to a large extent unknown to, uh, to the mining sector. Uh, a shift in how organizations started to work uh, also changed the, the, the paradigms uh, that the leaders had to follow from being very uh, compliance and performance based to uh, those uh, focusing on collaborative and, and system-driven capabilities. What it means for the mining, uh, for the mining sector, is, is mining sector uh, very um, efficient in implementing the changes? I would say this is one of the most, um, uh, mining sector is one of the most uh, modernized and 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 uh, let's say uh, environmentally friendly businesses uh, mining is very much uh, uh, is is very regulated therefore in terms of um, how mining operations work in in europe we can be very proud of of what we have achieved However, um, as, uh, as it, it has been said, uh, technical skills are te taken very much for granted. Uh, programs which involve uh, both academia as well as, as companies and, and, and industry organizations have a chance of building a set of, uh, of building a set of expertise uh, in, uh, that is relevant for future employers. Now, um, I, I, uh, I mean, we can refer to well-known reports such as, for example, Top Skills of 2025, which was published by World Economic Forum, which I'm going to quote. As you can see, uh, many of the skills such as analytical skills, uh, problem solving, critical thinking and analysis, creativity and originality and initiative, as well as reasoning, problem solving and ideation. Those skills are very much related to uh, problem solving. Some others of the top skills are related to self-management, and others are related to working with people. So if we look at the set of skills, we can see that only two of them are related to technical skills. 
So the conclusion is that uh, technical skills or, or let's say, uh, industry-related skills are very much taken for granted. We basically uh, uh, assume that if you graduated as engineer, your, your skills related to to engineering knowledge and expertise uh, are taken for granted. What differentiates uh, good engineers for, let's say, mediocre engineers is their ability to work in teams, to embrace change, and to um, to 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 operate and and cooperate with a different type of stakeholders. When I looked at um, at um, a main team project and and what what is offered to engineers. in your program are related to the so-called soft skills uh, or entrepreneurship, uh, which are also um, extremely in demand uh, on the market. Um, I, let me quote Charles Darwin. It's not the strongest of the species that survives, not the most intelligent that survives. It's the one that the most adaptable to change that lives with the means available and works corporately, cooperatively against common threats. Um, I mean, there's not much to add. Um, in order for students to, su to, to succeed, we need to take into consideration the following, the following factors. We need to be, uh, to, to, to be able to teach our students self-awareness. I mean, in, um, in our programs, the majority of our, of our courses that we deliver to member organizations are related to the so-called uh, soft skills. But first of all, in order to harness soft skills, you need to be able to say who you are. Therefore, uh, I mean, a lot of engineers need to be prepared, or future engineers, not, not just in mining industry, but in any industry, should understand and should be prepared to know who they are, what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, and how to, uh, and how to manage those uh, uh, default um, uh, settings in order to uh, profit yourself and also your organizations. Um, there are a lot of uh, tools available on the market, like extended this insights, Gallup talent, whatever, whatever sensitizes your students to uh, to to um, well find out. To, to whatever sensitizes them to know who they are is a, a good way forward. Uh, secondly, mining engineers will need to know how to communicate, not just orally, but also in the writing. Uh, moreover, they will have to communicate with a variety of stakeholders. Therefore, they have to understand that they need to be uh, they need to communicate not only with themselves, but also and, and foremostly with non-engineering professionals. Uh, they, they, had, they, they need to know how to get their message across in order to be understood, because this is their future, okay? Well, we all know that technology changes but their own learning is their responsibility. What, what they learn in your courses, and I'm sure you deliver uh, as a state of the art uh, knowledge to your students, is going to change. Maybe in six months time, uh, the, the knowledge that they learned is, will no longer be valid. Therefore, we have to ensure that our graduates are going to um, learn forever because this is what is going to make them successful. Um, I, uh, I'm bringing to your attention again uh, a list of skills 
needed for engineers to succeed, which I have taken from um, Indeed, which is a, a well-known job board. Uh, when you look at it, uh, the, 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 the majority of skills, such as trustworthiness, communication, self-confidence, assertiveness, empathy, inquisitiveness, and team spirit, all those skills could be labeled as soft skills, okay? So therefore, the, uh, the value of, of um, incorporating soft skills training is, is, is absolutely key to your uh, graduate success. With 25 years of experience, I can only say that uh, with, with, with hundreds of hours of training, uh, webinars, seminars delivered in, uh, during, in 24 years, we are very uh, confident that, that the value of uh, incorporating, uh, well, soft skills training into, uh, into uh, management courses or engineering courses is absolutely vital uh, to ensure that the graduates uh, uh, who are going to enter the, the job market or who are in jobs at the moment will be valuable to their employers. I mean, mining industry is a little bit difficult to change because it, it's got a, a reputation of being old fashioned with top down management culture. Uh, therefore, one of the um, of the ways of changing this culture is to ensure that um, young graduates will be able to work uh, well in a in a different way. That they will be able to work uh, both with fellow. Um, uh, fellow engineers, but also with with their bosses, and also will be able to get their message across to a wider audience. Uh, that they will be sensitized to um, the value that that their work brings to the whole environment. Uh, managers for future mining industry therefore need to be equipped with both technical and soft skills. And uh, well, because we need them and we expect that they will be able to uh, rethink how the mining business works and change this uh, top-down management culture into a more collaborative model. Um, one of the ways which we are very uh, proud to utilize is uh, involving mature professionals from our environment uh, to uh, ensure that young uh, graduates or aspiring managers are, are getting. Um, and and um, for four years now, we've been running a mentoring program uh, where we uh, sort of pair um, young professionals with uh, mature professionals so that they will be able to uh, benefit from their knowledge and expertise. And, and we hope that these well-prepared uh, uh, young managers will be able to um, foster a culture of innovation and will be advocates of uh, sustainable mining. Um, at the moment, we have uh, had uh, 12, uh, 75 uh, um, alumni of our mentoring program, and I would uh, strongly recommend using uh, and, and utilizing new technology uh, to employ uh, professionals who oftentimes do it for free and to uh, prepare your students for entering uh, the, the, the job market very confident with new skills and with the aspiration to change the mining sector. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope we'll be in touch. Uh, do not hesitate to uh, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn or, or by email. Thank you very much.
Good morning, everyone. And uh, I'm Fabio Ferri. I'm the education manager of uh, EIT Raw Materials at the South Heart Innovation Hub. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to present at this workshop. And I would like to give you um, uh, some hints on the how we at EIT Raw Materials are integrating innovation and new skills. And uh, thanks to um, education programs like Mating, which we support fi financially and we try to build thanks to the contribution of our partners. And um, as you know, uh, one very important issue of uh, Europe and of course of EIT Raw Materials is sustainability and uh, the green transition, the green economy and the, all this revolution that are starting now. And we, of course, are based this revolution uh, on resources, but not only on resources and also on talent potential, because this transition and this new future is happening only uh, if we combine the, the talent with the innovation. And uh, as already introduced by Juan uh, at, the, at the beginning of this uh, workshop, uh, you know that uh, the mining industry is really evolving. It's uh, actually a, a slow adapting uh, industry, but uh, the new technologies are shaping the future of mining industry thanks to integration of uh, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, or blockchain, or uh, all the digital twins and you know, things you uh, are maybe quite familiar with. But what is really important that, uh, is to keep in mind that the future of mining is still the people. So it's still the, the young generations, it's still the professionals, because they are able to uh, adapt all these new technologies, first to invent them, and then adapt to the, on the case-by-case -case, um, uh, reality of the, 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 the their operations. And so I think that the, the main focus of my presentation will be on this talent and the future of the talent. Uh, the industry of the future uh, in the mining sector will be highly integrated and multifaceted. So you can see from this uh, slide that we would like that this sector is typically the one where you have to integrate, of course, the technology, but also the, the economy, the, the way to secure resources or the exploration technology the education part with the talents and of course the social component with uh, this environmental, social and governance and SLO issues which is related to the social acceptance of all the, the operation in the field. And if we have a brief view on, the, um, uh, on this picture, it's a way to depict the future sustainable mining in a modern society. And you can see that from underground to the to the outside world, there's really a, a combination of, um, um, let's say, modern and challenging uh, places that we, we have in underground, of course, uh, the integration of autonomous uh, machines, of a way of uh, controlling the operation and day by day basis, a uh, way of securing the, um, uh, the safety of the people down in the mines. But also in outside, you can see that, for instance, you have the mineral processing, which is going to be very, uh, let's say, profiting from the, the new technologies, or the monitoring of the uh, mines, or the, the technology, thanks to drones or other instruments where you do the new exploration. So in all this picture, so the environment of the mine is really uh, evolving fast, and we want this environment to be very, very sustainable. And uh, I like a little bit this image because it's very schematic. Maybe it's <laughs> a little bit simplified, but uh, I think it's useful to understand what is happening now because in the digital revolution, uh, on, the, on the top part of this circle, we, you can see that the, the present is where the yellow line is above the blue line. So the technology is increasing and changing at a pace which is much faster than the skills. So the, the technology advancement requires the people to upskill quickly. And uh, uh, in this transitional period, there's a little bit of stress. 
which is in the, both the society and the, the, the talents. And so it's what we want to achieve thanks to programs like Mayteam or our ed education uh, projects. And of course, if we achieve this match, then we will get much faster a prosperity for all the society. And um, this is just an example of uh, uh, from the Lloyd Insights, where uh, uh, some uh, key points for intelligent mining are being pointed out, and because the future of mining need to uh, focus on integration of operation and governance. So we need probably for the future mines to have more centralized governance, appro governance approach to operational. Uh, then mines also need to optimize the technology architecture. So they really want to forecast their, their future and the targets, and then how to integrate the new technology into this path towards such targets. And of course, in this picture, they have to understand which are the skills needed. And this is where exactly we are, the, the point we are focusing on the, uh, the skill gaps and the, the skill required for the future. And uh, I would like to thank the, pre the, the previous speakers because she actually introduced some of this uh, skill analysis, which is actually uh, also depicted in this uh, image. Uh, the, the previous speaker highlighted the importance of uh, uh, soft skills, let's say, and the integration of these skills into the programs. And here you can uh, really see an, um, a report from uh, the Mineral Council of Australia uh, which try to map exactly what kind of enhancement is required for these skills. And you can see, for example, in the black line, uh, the current skill type of uh, professional and, and, and students, of course, and uh, in yellow, the, the future skills which are demanded for the, for let's say, ne the next 10 years of the of mining uh, operation. And so you can see that besides the technical skills, which are remaining more or less at the same level, because it's more uh, operational related and possibly more automized and digitalized in the future, all the other skills are requiring some uh, enhancement uh, from the basic skills, so the mathematics, literacy or whatever, but also the complex uh, problem solving skills, the management skills, which were also very well highlighted by the previous speakers, where the future engineers have also to manage the, their teams and the, their operations very efficiently in a different way. The social skills are extremely important, so the communication, of course, but also the collaboration and uh, with the integration with their society and the system skills, which, which is where very much is required enhancement in the future. So that it's related to system evaluation and system analysis because the problems are getting more and more complex. So system evaluation is really, really important. And uh, we can see also in this image that uh, let's say in most of the mining uh, occupation, let's say, we um, have just a limited portion which will be automated. So this is the forecast. So probably only mostly the occupations which are related to technical parts, but all the other uh, occupation will be, will require some either enhancement or a redesign. So that's why it's really important to think on how we want this, to achieve this risk yield and uh, uh, enhancement. So the, the new profiles and new capabilities of the, the future workforce is, is extremely important. And, um, and the mineral industry need to be very proactive in this sector, uh, in this uh, response, let's say. Uh, another point which is very important to highlight is that the uh, mineral industry is probably increasing the number of employees in the future, at least if we look at the uh, also the European um, situation, we really forecast that a lot of people will be required uh, in the future. And this is just some examples from uh, from Finland, because we are in La Peranta now, and maybe we can just mention that uh, just in this recent report from the future skills in Finland, we will, uh, the country will need a lot of people. There's already a shortage in aging, in, uh, in Finland, there's an estimation that more than 
130,000 new experts will be required in the next 10 years, so it's a lot of people. So it's good reason to come to Finland and uh, experience this this country and work for this country and for Europe, of course. And uh, in the metal processing industry, you can see that the figures here uh, just don't go to mm, don't need to go into details. But there's a lot of opportunities, but a lot of challenges as well. Uh, so what what does it mean? This means that. If the future of work will be affected by these technologies, of course, also the education will be uh, will need to play a key role in this in shaping the, this future. We, we saw in the previous image in these graphics, let's say very quickly, that all the skills will need to be enhanced, no? And so the um, we will mostly need very very uh, edu highly educated people. Uh, especially at bachelor's level qualifications, and so the university is uh, uh, will be mm, will need to redesign uh, the the curriculum, and uh, this is one of the reasons we are here today to redesign a very important and strategic curriculum in uh, in the mining industry. So now uh, this is a little bit of introduction, a long introduction to our role as EIT raw materials and what we can do in this respect because EIT Raw Materials um, is a large community, is a knowledge innovation community which is part of EIT, which the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. Uh, we are uh, um, distributed along, around, uh, around Europe, so we are covering more or less all the countries and especially we have a large number of partners in our community from university industries, RTOs, which are asked uh, and encouraged to cooperate uh, to solve the challenges that we are I was describing a little bit uh, in my presentation. We work more or less in this uh, value chain perspective. So in the, this is a value chain on raw materials. So, so our topics are starting from exploration and mining, um, but going through the value chain to also designing of materials, recycling, uh, and so on. And how do we do it? We do it basically by uh, promoting the, the community, promoting the innovation, and promoting the education. So if you focus on the inner part of this uh, graphic, you can see that acceleration, which is for us education, is where we really try to, to enhance the technology, find the solutions. So we ask the partners, we support the partners also with funds to innovate, also in the mining sector, of course. We promote the startups to find solutions and, and so on. But also on the right side, we innovate the academy, we innovate the education, and we start from uh, the wider society, from the pupils, from the, the common people. We go on with the university, master and PhD programs, and we continue with the uh, lifelong professional education. So we will try, we, what we want to do is to uh, focus on the life cycle of innovators in uh, solving all these ch uh, challenges and the technology advancement. And um, very quickly on the labeled master programs, because May team is one of these uh, label programs that we are trying to, that we are supporting actually. And uh, here it's, uh, this picture is an overview of the current programs, the current portfolio of uh, label programs. I don't want to go into many details, but you can see that um, if we take uh, the, the value chain uh, down on the left, so the, the idea was to cover all this value chain with the education opportunities. So for instance, we have uh, some programs uh, designed for exploration geologies, which is Ramans, for instance. We have a program which is uh, covering the mining engineering uh, uh, running program, but which is EMC. And uh, we have a program on uh, sustainable uh, materials and so on, uh, and other uh, recycling. So the idea was really to, to create the talents for all the sectors uh, and all the, the segments of the value chain. And uh, this portfolio is not static, so we are continuing developing the portfolio. And so, for instance, 
uh, the mining, uh, the current mining uh, master en mastering mining engineer will be discontinued, but there will be a new one that will be mating coming in the next year, hopefully very soon. And uh, then we have new ones in uh, raw materials value chains, mineral exploration, which means that we are continuously uh, developing this strategy for talents. And uh, as regarding the, the master in mining engineering, we, we I'm very happy that tomorrow we will have a, a student, a, gradu a recent graduate, who will really bring his experience. So I encourage you to also join tomorrow in the presentation. He is met in Islander and will bring a, a fresh uh, experience from this. Uh, what, what does it mean to, for a student to join these programs? And um, as a general state, I would like to, to show you what, what I believe, what we believe there are the key points and the key uh, innovations in this, uh, such programs. Uh, the first one is the internationalization. Of course, there are programs which are built thanks to the university partners, more than one university, of course, through the industrial partners, RTOs and so on, because we really believe that uh, the, the culture of diversity is important. And especially in the mining sector, uh, we think that we really need the, the contribution of uh, uh, not only um, of women, but also in general terms of diversity, because the European society is getting very, very complex and we need the contribution of all these people. And of course, the diversity uh, work environment is uh, one of the key for the future uh, of our uh, Euro of the U of Europe as a society, and uh, I think uh, Matty will really bring his uh, his positive experience on this. And then we have the T shape and soft skills because uh, um, soft skills are all important in this program and. Uh, are really required to be part of the curricula. And uh, T-shaped means that you have a core uh, of, uh, um, of knowledge, which is of course part of your uh, identity as a, as a student, as a professional, but then you have these arms where you, have, you are acquiring all the skills needed for these new jobs. And then you have this uh, knowledge triangle integration, we call like this because we, we want as EIT community to integrate industry contribution the RTO contribution, the research center's contribution, and the university, of course. We want the academia to work with industry and RTOs, but also we want the industry to give some indication in developing the programs, to offer internships, to give experience to the students, and really shape uh, the, the knowledge which is required for the future. And uh, entrepreneurship, of course, it's very, very important that this ideas will come to a reality and so we want them the, the students to, to, to bring them really on uh, on our society and uh, for entrepreneurship there will be also a, a keynote tomorrow by uh, Maria and uh, I will really encourage, encourage you to to take part also to uh, what she will tell us about entrepreneurship in uh, in mating program and uh, another thing which is important linking with entrepreneurship, is a new initiative uh, that we are uh, we have launched in March uh, this year, uh, because uh, EIT raw materials uh, does want to shape not only the single curricula of the programs in the university, but they really want to have a, a systemic change in the university in Europe. So uh, thanks to the strong support of the Commission for Innovation Research and uh, Culture, Maria Gabriel. So we really started this initiative. EIT Raw Material is uh, coordinating the Higher Education Initiative and um, together with the other, uh, the other uh, knowledge community of EAT. And really the focus is to um, innovate the potential of Europe. So increase the entrepreneurial and innovative potential of, uh, of European University. This is a very wide and ambitious initiative and uh, which wants to, to produce, as I said, a systemic institutional change where uh, all the people in the university system are upskilled, they will be partner, they will be asked to innovate their, uh, their position, their roles, to be interpreter, uh, entrepreneurs, 
and to share the knowledge. Also, this sharing is really, really one of our uh, ideas. So the, the knowledge must be for everyone. So we want to share them. There was a very high interest from the university. I don't want to go into details, but we have partners also of mating, which are in uh, some of the funded projects. And uh, um, we will also have a new call coming uh, right now that was just being opened this week on the 18th of November. So all the participants who are online and who are interested are, uh, can reach myself or the other education managers for more information. Uh, so this is all and thanks a lot for your attention. Okay. Um, I guess um, this is all set up, hopefully. I hope you hear me. This is Sol Villara. Nice to meet you all. Um, thank you for inviting me uh, this morning to the second international workshop on skills and competencies on the 21st century, century workforce. Um, I'm the HRBP uh, for Atlantic Copper, and um, I'm very pleased to, to share with you this 20 minutes uh, where I'm, I'm trying to bring you um, some of the stuff or uh, some of the stuff that I've seen in other presentations in the previous one, but it's true that I'm trying to bring it to here with the link of skills and what we need and be very, um, let's say, very, uh, very concrete, very, uh, very um, specific, to say it that way. Um, the first thing I would like to, to bring here is that we have a universe uh, right now. And when I say we have a universe right now, I mean, it's obvious that we've always had it, but we're living right now in a an uh, era where all changes are uh, being very motivated by people. I mean, if we think about the uh, Climate Change Conference, uh, COP 2021, we see how social um, uh, opinion, it's impacting so hard on the, the policy uh, decisions and on the policy tendencies in order to and mark and to establish the goals for the future. And that's very important because uh, if you think about when, when we, we talk about skills and work and competencies for the workforce, we're talking about skills and competencies for people. And people are the ones who are pushing towards whatever the world has to be drawing the future. And that's, that's quite important. Uh, we have to be ready and we have to be prepared in order to give that answer to whatever we are asking for. So in a way, uh, it's a circular uh, thought. If we think about the second sta uh, uh, statement or the 
second idea I wanted to bring here. It is Industry 5.0. Um, I understand that uh, Industry 5.0 might be a, a term that it's very, it's quite common for you. For the, for others might be quite new, but in a, we'll see it, how it's linked to the previous one. But the most important thing in here is that people is besides industry 5.0. This uh, uh, five uh, industry 5.0, it's a human centric um, uh, thought and a human centric um, 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 methodology or um, uh, um, statements that tries to put uh, industry and technology to think about what it can both of it can do for us, for people, and for the planet. So it comes up with the first statement of what us people want the world to be, and uh, it comes us to with the uh, what. Um, what people have to do to be prepared to do it. And the third one that I'm gonna base my speech on is the future of jobs report from October 2020 from uh, the World Economic Forum. Um, and this um, uh, report, we can see like uh, what the gaps are for the future jobs in 2025, out of all the uh, many companies out of 26 countries and uh, what the conclusions are. And, uh, and, and I'm going to try to link the three things and to link, uh, w w if we think we're thinking about October 2020 and uh, industry, um, uh, European Commission in paper, uh, it's from January 2021. And uh, we're talking about the COP conference from that just finished on the, uh, October, uh, November 13th, 2021. So we are talking about very, very recent events and very recent um, um, uh, thoughts that are linked with just one year ago report. And we're going to see how well it all uh, gets perfectly aligned with the competencies that we, we think or I think that uh, could help for the world and for the professionals that uh, want to take part and are responsible for whatever we as a community and as a society are working. Um, when we talk about the climate change um, and, and, and the conference, and we see what the four main statements um, have come out from, uh, we see that we want a secure and global um, net zero mid-century and keep 1.5 degree uh, reach. And uh, when we think about that, uh, we are saying that a country has been asked to, to establish an ambitious um, plan to cut down emissions um, before 2030. And, and the reduction targets are aligned with reaching net zero and by the middle of the century. And, and, and they're saying that countries should accelerate their base out of coal, uh, curtail deforestation, speed up the switch up to electri electrical vehicle, and encourage investment in renewables. So Thinking about that we're talking in a technical and mineral um, um, workshop, um, I would say that there is so many challenges in here for you to enter Pearl um, and to initiate an innovation towards all these lines that it's quite important that you consider as uh, these lines, as maybe as a career to take uh, your your future on, and and and, and on the other side, um, they're also saying that 
we have to adapt to protect communities and natural habits. And we're talking here also something that comes linked with the industry, industry 5.0, which is human centric. We're talking about uh, that right now, even though we're establishing, establishing uh, objectives and goals for 2030, we already are damaging the, the planet and we're uh, we are already emitting uh, CO2 and we're all ready to end deforestation. And what we're thinking is how, how could we make cities and societies more resilient and more um, uh, sustainable in order to um, get uh, these goals reached? So the point is, what can you do to get this uh, goals, to reach these goals, to help it out. And that's something that we always uh, we, we also have to think about in order to establish the skills that we want to reach. Okay. Um, and then, um, we, obviously, all of this has to be done with money. We have to, as a, as, uh, as a worldwide responsible, every country has to mobilize financial funds. And, um, and uh, we're talking about um, many funds that will be dedicated to these projects. So we have, I mean, they're telling us what they want to do or what they are expecting us to do or you to do. And uh, they are telling you how they are going to finance it. So it's important to have that in mind. And the fourth thing is that they're saying is that we should work together to deliver. And and when they say they sh that we all should work together, we should that they're they're thinking about us as countries, but they're also thinking about the collaboration in between the public, the administration, governments, business, and civil, uh, and civil society. Um, I think this is a good, um, a good, um, good uh, proof of how institutions like universities, um, business like us, and civil society work together and collaborate and talk. And that's something that should be very, very um, uh, pushed during the next years, because th this is not something about um, society responsible, because they are the ones that are proposing it, or it's not about companies that are one the ones that that uh, have the most uh, power or to and independence to act or are not about governments who are the ones who establish the policies. It's about all of us. So it's very important to have an open mind in collaboration and in um, uh, working and talking to other, to other uh, communities and uh, to other sectors and understanding how policy works and what the, uh, the funds, how they work how the European Commission works. And this is a very good proof. We are in the EIT raw materials. So we're all included in an uh, umbrella uh, academic or um, action right now, which is um, uh, taken care of by the uh, an, a European organism. And uh, the third, the second point I would like to talk to you is about industry um, 5.0. As I told you before, it's a very uh, new uh, paper policy brief, which just came out in January 2021, even though it's quite uh, earlier. The, the concept uh, came earlier from Japan, and I think it was in something like 2016, but it's been developed lately. Um, and, uh, and this concept, it's uh, an evolution of how societies are linked to industry. If we think about the first and second um, part of society where uh, there's no um, uh, revolution is not impact by industry, we're talking about hunting and gathering, and uh, we're uh, talking about agriculture economies, and we're, uh, it's not very, I mean, industry is not a very um, 
of uh, main factor or influence factor. But when we think about society 3.0, where we have the steam, where we have the machines, where we have we start producing as a, a chain, um, then we think about how industry is impacting on society. And uh, uh, industry obviously um, improves um, efficiency and profits for the companies, but it also impacts very highly on society. Um, it, free, it makes more p uh, people more free to do all the things and it it changes life itself for everyone and um, when we go to industry 4.0 which is the fourth uh, revolution we're talking about the um, dominance of information we're talking about how to who could get the most information and who could manage it and who can um, in a way make it more profitable for the company um, and now we get to industry uh, 5.0, and we're talking about 20, uh, uh, 2020. And in here, we're talking about uh, how society attempts to balance the economy development with the revolution, a resolution of society, uh, societal and environmental problems. It's not restricted to ma the manufacturer sector, but addresses large society challenges based on the integration of physical and virtual spaces. So society 5.0 is a society in which advanced uh, from IT technologies, internet, things of uh, robots, artificial intelligence, and argue, uh, augmented reality are actively used in everyday life, industry, healthcare, and other sp uh, spheres of activity, not primarily from the economy advantage, but for the benefit and the convenience of every citizen. So we come here again to put together um, how all the technologies, and we put it together towards the human-centric um, focus. As we said before, uh, the human-centric uh, focus has been um, placed or it's been very present and uh, it had a very, very uh, special position in the COP26 uh, and the COP 26 and, uh, um, uh, industrial uh, industry 5.0. So we all, we find again the focus on the how to take care of the planet and how to take care of the human. And uh, when we talk about um, Industry 5.0, we're talking about a human-centric, sustainable, and resilient. I think we've been talking about this before. I mean, if you see it, it's all linked. And we, we're saying that instead of rather uh, than taking emerged technology as a starting point and exampling its potential for increasing efficiency, a human-centric approach an industry puts the core uh, human needs and interest at the heart of the production process. We're thinking that rather than asking what we can do for new technology or with new technology, we ask what new technology could do for us. And um, we're saying that rather than asking the industry work to adapt his skills or her skills to the needs of rapidly evolving of technology, we want to use technology to adapt the production for process to the needs of the worker, like in training or like in practicing. And what we're saying is like how we can put all together, all the technology, obviously to make more profitable, profitable the company and, and, and more efficient, as we said in the industry 4.0. But we're also thinking about taking care of the planet. We're also thinking about the human being and a human being. So what, what we're saying is that, um, and this focus, uh, when we have Industry 5.0, we ask, why should we do this? Okay, if we want to reduce costs, obviously, we have to use industry and we have to use technology and information to work on it. But we also can empower workers to use that information and to use it in different ways in order to 
more uh, make an easier life for them too. I mean, we're not saying that technology, uh, we cannot allow that technology is just only pushing uh, people out of the process. We're thinking about how people can have a better place in the pro or be very p better placed in the process. We're talking also about a competitive industry attracting the best talent. Because if we have an industry that takes care and uh, has a human-centric uh, focus, we're thinking about, I like that. I might like that. I mean, I would like that, obviously. So that might be something that attracts people. And adapt training and evolving the skills. We're thinking about how can we make things easier for the people. Um, a competitive edge in new markets. We're talking about a new, different focus, an innovative vision of what we're doing. And uh, obviously, we are talking about safety and well-being. What things can industry, I mean, technology can do with for me that minimizes my risk, that minimizes emissions, that minimizes everything. And I just can um, work on um, how can I use this technology to improve my experience as, a, as an employee. And finally, once we've seen the COP26, we've seen the, few, the, um, the industry 5.0, I would like to introduce a more uh, uh, Analyst and analysis of skills. That's what, what we, I, we, what I wanted to talk to. So you'll be like saying, okay, she's telling us all this, that we already in a way know that's happened, that it's going on, and how do I link it with the skills? Okay, um, and this report, I just um, identified two big, or I just emphasize in two, uh, two um, graphics. The first one is where the demand is increasing and where is decreasing. Okay, we see that it all comes from all that we've been talking about, all these uh, jobs that are uh, and whose demand uh, or which demand is increasing. It's all about uh, industry 4.0. If you think about data analysis, scientists, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, especially big data, all these jobs that are using the information to make it more efficient and more um, profitable, all the companies and all the process and business are the ones who are coming up, all right? Um, we also have a strategic uh, advisors. We need people that think about what's going on in the world, what's the world asking for, what's the, what are the tendencies, how can I attract the talent? We need people that think about how to do things, where to put the focus on. Okay, and we obviously need the risk management specialist. I mean, there's quite a big, a bit, but project managers, obviously, but there's a lot of information, digital business uh, development uh, in here, business development professionals, obviously is very important for all these new things, initiatives that we should take on. So all these um, um, are uh, jobs that are gonna be uh, very demanded and that could be something to start your career on. On the other hand, we have uh, the ones that are decreasing, all the entry data, all the things that can be done by a machine, all of this is obviously coming down at the decreasing demand. And I mean, it's um, obviously if we're using machines to do all the analytics and all the data. Um, we've got people that can be done doing other things. And in here, uh, we have um, we, we have the top 15 skills that came out of the study. And uh, to me, it's important um, how uh, we have obviously analytical thinking and innovation. We're thinking about that and information, how to manage um, um, information. But it's important too, that we have self human uh, competencies, which are very important. And the second one that for me is the first one, uh, is active learning and learning strategies. It is so important to be aware of what the world wants, what the company wants, and to just make a strategy, self strategy to know what do I want to do and how do I get the knowledge to 
reach it out and to do whatever I really like. That's where I'm going to be happy with. That's where I'm going to uh, do a lot of for whatever goal I want to reach. And that's what society or the role that society is taking in all these lately uh, years, as we've seen before. Critical thinking, creativity, or originally initiative leadership. I mean, all these initiatives, I, uh, I can just name them, but I'd rather just put them all together with the three um, um, areas that we've gone through. The first one is the climate change conference. So in here, I just took the uh, top 15 skills from the World Economic Forum and just thought, okay, if I have to change the world, you have, if I have to tell the companies, hey, let's reduce um, emissions, how about I need persuasion and negotiation? How about I need leadership and social influence? Because we need to do, we need to change how things are done. And I need to think about critical thinking and analysis. I need to think about what we do and why we do it that way. And that's very important. We need to think and to uh, just question everything that we're doing right now to change the world. That's the world asking us, and that's what we want to do. Industry 5.0, if we remember, remember about the human-centric and how technology is but, and how we think about what technology can do for us. Okay, then we have to change the roles. We have to, to be creative, to be original, to have initiative, to think about how I can reduce risk, how I can make a job more inclusive, because you don't need to be so strong or you can, you can have um, other, you don't need certain uh, skills that a machine can do for you or can replace them. You need to think about what people, if we are once, or how people think. If we're thinking about human centric, I have to be emotional. I have to have emotional intelligence and service orientation for the client, but also for the worker. And last, as I said before in the World Economic Forum, I just um, put the three ones there are all companies said that it was so important for new workers or for workers that are already involved in the company because remember that we are having a learning a long learning education that it's it's very important for all companies to change the workforce that we have right now and it is analytical thinking and innovation active learning and learning a strategy and complex uh, problem solving. They're all linked and they're all aligned uh, to um, whatever or what the world is asking us to do. Well, uh, that I hope I'm on time. Sorry if I am just got uh, run out a little bit late on the minutes. Um, that's what I wanted to tell you. Uh, thanks for att your attention. I don't know if um, uh, you have any question or whatever, I guess, on the chat or, or MG, um, throughout the organization. I'm very available for whatever you, are, you need. And uh, thank you very much. I hope you have a great day and best regards from Madrid, Spain. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers for uh, very insightful talks. Uh, now it's time for a short summary. Um, okay, do you recognize this woman? Uh, yeah, that's Beata. And uh, this is our artistic tribute to her. So it's a surprise because today we have an artist among us. It's Satu Cousins. Uh, who is visualizing our event in an artistic way. So, welcome, Satu. Uh, the art uh, is what allows us to act outside the box. 
uh, we break boundaries and we can increase creativity. So this is what we expect from the future mining managers and this is what Beata was talking about today. Uh, so the sustainable mining requires a new type of technological experts capable of empowering, empowering people to think fresh and collaborate across boundaries. Building a new inclusive culture of trust and respect will be vital for attracting and retaining the current and future talent that mining companies will rely on. This is a key message from Beata and I hope that you uh, read this message as well as me. And Fabio, doesn't he look alike? Do you like it, Fabio? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember uh, Fabio's speech? Thanks to him, uh, we know that AIT raw materials uh, is contributing to educational shift by implementing of higher education initiative, uh, a new initiative established by AIT and uh, AIT Kicks to unlock the full innovation potential of higher education institutions. Um, and the next is Sol. Yeah, how about Sol? Yeah, she is quite similar. Doesn't she look great? Yeah, she looks. Uh, with Sol, we together took a quick walk across a triang triangle that will open trials towards to think about one's learning strategy. So uh, once more, thank you all the speakers. And before we move to the next point of our agenda for today, I just want to remind you about the second part of the workshop, uh, about the small group discussions that will start just right after the lunch break. But please uh, try to connect to the Zoom meeting before the break, before we leave for a coffee and for a lunch. Uh, today we will discuss two topics. Uh, it will be uh, target groups and marketing and teaching methods. And now, let me invite to the stage Mati Lampinen. Yes. Uh, Mati is a director of Explorer Network Education Lead at LUT, who will facilitate uh, today the round table. Mati, the floor is yours. Thank you.
So, welcome for the roundtable discussion part of, of this workshop. So, I think at first I would like to thank the great keynote speakers. So, I think we got really, really good view on the, let's say, the landscape on, on this field and, and what, what are the needs and, 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 and on the whole overview, I would say, uh, really nicely covered. So, we have here also the, uh, from one keynote speaker with us, but also also we have two uh, representatives from Metso Autotech. So, so maybe if you first introduce yourselves as, as we go ladies first today, so please go ahead. Okay, if I start. Um, my name is Anita Saarinen and I work as a HR manager at Metso Autotech at the moment. Hi everyone, my name is Wilhelmina Rikon and I work as a learning and, mani learning and development manager at Metsa Autotech. Okay, so great, welcome. And so maybe it's time to present myself. So I'm Matti Lampinen, as, as already introduced. So work here as a, at LUT University as a lead in educational development and, and work with, with various international networks that, that our university is, is connected with. So. Then maybe then jumping in the discussion part. So I think we got really good uh, view on the things that, that, that are under discussion. So maybe I would a little bit like to widen widen the view or, or let's say maybe also look bit history. I, I saw it, it was really really looking in, into today's situation and, and also also in the in the future. But but of course we have to bear in mind when, when we talk about a mining industry or raw materials industry that we are talking about quite complex industry. And, and some people say that it's even the most complex industry in the world, comprising of thousands and thousands of unit operations. So, so of course, if, if you uh, top that with that, it has been quite uh, much, uh, let's say, dependent on, on the practical knowledge. And, and uh, if, if looking at the history already in the back in the uh, 30 years ago in, in Finland, we, we saw that or, or in the governmental level that there, there in future there isn't that much, uh, let's say, uh, investment in, in mining in, in Finland. So, so did they define, decided to decline and, and, and look into more in the technology and I, ICT. And, and now if we look at today, we are in a totally different situation. But, but what happened then that then, then when there has been these mining booms, there is really lack of talent. And, and, and then, then it comes to down that they, they have already started to ask him people that are retired because they have so much accumulated knowledge. And, and I think this is, this is one thing that, that we are now, now also facing, that a lot of people are retiring and a new generation is coming. So how, how do we connect this, this really uh, long time accumulated knowledge to this? Uh, and, and put it into minds or in practice also in, in future. So, so I would maybe like to start start, start with this. So, so maybe I will I will uh, let uh, Fabio first uh, give his view on, on this. That how do you see this generation different? That we have really much accumulated knowledge on, on this, and, and on the on the same time we are, we are in a digital rev revolution. So, so we have this re really good uh, let's say technology, but, but we also need this, this, this accumulated knowledge. So how we can all combine this and, and make, make the, uh, the whole sector even, even better in, in future. Yes, thanks a lot for this not easy question, but <laughs> I, I think it's, it's really a, an important point for this specific sector that we, we, we work in both in two directions from, from one side we have the, uh, let's call it old generation, but the, let's say the uh, classical uh, experts in, and workers in the field, which needs to be upskilled. And on the other side, the people who are also eventually retired, which need to transfer their knowledge to, to the new generation or even to new sectors, because sometimes you have very well skilled people who are who were working for the different departments, which are able to use the knowledge or transfer the knowledge in new, in new opportunities. So, as uh, as the ATRO materials, what we are doing is try to, as, as you saw the, the previous presentation, is also to tackle the professional education. So it's the learning process is continuous. So we really 
want the new professionals either to upskill or to benefit from the experience of the others. So in practical terms, what we do is to, to promote uh, education courses thanks to our partners, thanks to the industry, thanks to the workers in the industry, and uh, together with the expertise of, of uh, university academia. But, uh, but I think this is one really key point. So the upskilling of the, workfo the, the workforce, but also the transfer of their expertise in, uh, in the new generations. So it's yeah, not easy, but it's something that we really need to, to tackle. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I, I understand this. This is not a well, well, we are not facing easy yeah, challenges, yeah, no, no, no. So, so there is no easy questions either. So, so all the morning was on challenges, so that's yeah, yeah, an additional yeah, one. Yeah. yeah. So, but how how about how, how do you see it from from the company of Metro Autotech perspective? How how do you see this see this view and and how do you adapt to this? Well, this is a big challenge for us as well. Uh, uh, what we have done, for example, internally, we have um, launched. Uh, twice actually one uh, competence development programs for metallurgists and um, that was a two years program yeah. and we included a lot of um, well there is also the tech technology um, specific knowledge and and that's also a requirement for for our um, candidates but also uh, what is very much highlighted um, are those soft skills and um, internally, um, we, we, are, we have also done some, some um, other competence development programs and, and such as mentoring or, or uh, shadowing or, or this, this kind of uh, programs. Yeah, and I can add that uh, this program this started a few years back when we noticed that we have um, many, many employees of our current employees that they will retire in, in some uh, in sometime in the future, near future, and we wanted to, to launch this program to hire new metallurgists and to learn from the, from the current ones, from the old ones, from the senior ones. And I think we have uh, succeeded quite well and uh, we have hired those metallurgists as uh, about 12 and almost all of them are still with us. So it's quite good. Yeah. And if I can add a comment, because <laughs> I was inspired by, by you. It is uh, uh, extremely difficult, for instance, in countries like Italy. I'm, I'm from Italy, but also another example where some of this knowledge has been lost. We used to be mining countries until uh, the end of the 80s, more or less. And then we decided to stop with this operation. And now this knowledge, both professionally, professionally and also in academia, has been lost. So which is really, really difficult to recover. So some part of Europe are, of Europe are actually facing this, uh, this difficulty because uh, really you are now going back to this um, problem of sustainability and resources, which is a European-wide prob uh, problem. And now the, the knowledge is being lacked. And uh, uh, so what we are, are also trying is to, to use the experience of country like Finland, for instance, which are continuously developing this uh, panorama workforce and take the advantage of the, the, their experience and also other countries uh, integrating the network. But it's really, as I said, it's really difficult for countries which are decided to abandon for various reasons this kind of uh, uh, work and uh, talents and uh, education yeah yeah i think this this well highlights highlights the fact that that we need long long-term views or even from the governmental level mm. so so that there is that you don't build expertise in a day it, it is really really uh, coming down to need, need a long history and, and, and good good practices and so on so so this this of course highlights also the, the matter that we need more more work in, in Europe also in cooperation uh, with, with different parts of the Europe as, as we have uh, of course different different levels on, on the education level systems also in the sense that that I uh, already discussed in several years ago with with, with academic colleagues they, they have been discussing about this this situation that is it is that, that uh, uh, let's say that 
uh, area itself it is not attractive for young talent, but also, also they, they they have lost lost the, the, let's say the old talent if, if we if we like that like that to say that because the whole educational system is is is, is also uh, uh, cut down. So so this this is a really really a challenge. So but maybe 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 next next then. Can, I, can I comment one more, yes. one more time? Uh, yes. One very important topic is that uh, after we uh, became a new company, Metso Tech, we launched Metso Tech Training Academy, where we uh, develop technical trainings for the whole company and also for our customers. So that's a, a very kind of a big investment for for um, developing the tech technology related competencies in our company. Yeah, yeah, this this is a good. Good, good thing to mention that that has also also in the in the what we saw saw in the in those keynotes that that actually technical expertise is taken more or less in granted in in this sector, yeah. but but it's not always so because yeah. we have to have uh, various kind of people and, and not all these these have technical expertise in the sense, but maybe maybe then next uh, if if we jump jump into next next job topic that is well, well maybe easily easily drawn from here that is is the young talent and as as has been said that the whole sector ha has been had this challenge of of not attracting too much talent and and there there is of course various various reasons and it, it's it's not the most attractive sector for young young people to uh, come come to work and educate themselves for this field so how do you see this? Uh, maybe we start from the company perspective. You, you already mentioned that you, you have had these programs for, for young, young talent and, and they, they have stayed in, in your company and, and they, they have really, really enjoyed it. It, it. it tells that you're doing things right and, and especially what it comes from, from the, for the young, young talent. So how do you see the situation in overall? Well, um, <clears throat> as, um, as a new, newly combined company, a new company, we, we cannot do, um, well, we have started a lot of uh, work with employer branding. And when we are creating our culture, that's also something that is um, or is um, kind of um, the attractive part because new, these new talents, young, young talents, they really um, emphasize the company culture as well. It's not that we have these technologies. If you know that, if you can learn, you can you can come to us. They, it's kind of a other way around. They are asking about our culture, our way of working. How do we kind of um, develop their skills, and and are we interested in in developing their skills and competencies in the um, in the future? So that's a, that's also something that the. Especially the young younger generation, they they come and they they ask the employer that what what can you do for me yeah. to develop myself? Yeah. So so it's a kind of challenge, but uh, we are we are I think we are going to the right right direction with that, and um, and also uh, I would I would mention that um, when we when we had the program and we we recruited those metallurgists there were not so many applicants from Finland actually but we we recruited uh, from many other countries and they came to Finland yeah yeah this this mm -hmm. gives a good impression that that we are we are in the quite quite global situation and uh, of course the work workforce is is moving <laughs> let's say Nowadays, is it too easy? But but in any way, it tells that that it, it it is the let's say the whole whole communities are are chasing also also in the work workplaces. But how do you see this from the EAD raw materials perspective? But what do you see that is it is it easy for you? For ex example, in in terms that you have quite wide uh, pro educational portfolio, so so it is is it easy to get the students? Interested in those those programs and and, and, and are, are do you having too much or too less or <laughs> what is the situation? <laughs> I think that one uh, one major issue is of course attracting the people and secondly, especially in the mining sector, att attracting women, because you know that the you will know that the occupation of women in the mining sector is between I would say eight, 17 percent something like this, and uh, below 20 percent. 
So there's the, the, the topic of the, the gender balance is a priority in general for, for Europe. So it's not only IT raw materials, it's all the institute, it's all the education actions of uh, the European Commission. So we also have some very specific uh, programs developed uh, for uh, attracting the females to the mining industry. Well, not only mining industry, let's say raw material sector. But what is really important is that this process has to start very early. So you cannot just convince the people when they finish the secondary school just to go for this mining sector. That's an interest, a curiosity that must be cultivated from the very, very beginning, very early age. So that's why when we, I was presenting a little bit the, the life cycle of innovators, I was also mentioning that our programs also are addressed to pupils, also go to young generations, because we want to show them the opportunities of the field of raw materials and what they can bring to the on the table. So it's it's a long process, but we are trying to to, to do it very very uh, in a very focused way. So it's but uh, but I would say that in general the the gender topic is is one of top priority. But I'd like always to put not only gender. I like to pref I prefer to put the diversity mm -hmm. uh, topic because it's not only the female. The female are a part, of course, of our. Uh, uh, activities, but the, you, see, you know the European society is getting more and more complex, and there's uh, the culture of diversity is something which we see really beneficial in industry, in academia, in every place, but especially probably for the for the mining sector. Yeah, yeah this this is true, and I think it it comes down well to our, our ne next, well, say the topic or, or more or less this discussion about gender balance and, and of course of course we have to talk about in the same the diversity in in, in let's say in, in different uh, let's say workplaces or or, or industry or, or whatever is it is it academia so so of, of course we need people with with various backgrounds and I think already quite many companies they started or, or are talking about that they the company need to be like a society, so it, it represents the whole represents the whole diversity of the people of, of that society. So I think this is a really, really uh, let's say, right right perspective in the sense that that we we of course as as a sector we, we need to also uh, more show and, and be more connected into whole whole society. And of course we can do do this best by that way that we have the whole let's say. In, in the sense that the society in, in minimum or minimized form in, inside the company. So, so this, this, this creates the, the culture that, that we are, what we are maybe lacking in, in the sector. Uh, but yeah, you already talk about like, like this is a long term, <laughs> let's say, uh, or uh, requires quite, quite long, long term actions. So you, it cannot be done in, in, in a couple of years, uh, but, but maybe Again, starting from from Metro Auto Tech perspective, so how do you see this gender balance as 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 a let's say technology companies is is usually quite easily understood that it's it's more attracts uh, let's say uh, male than than female or, or are you doing some uh, some special let's say attention for for recruiting or or or, or attracting more 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 female applicants or or how do you see this or what is your let's say strategy in in this matter um i think uh at least so far it has been it has been or come quite naturally this div division between men and women so we we actually if i if i uh, take an example, for example, these metallurgists that we recruited, I think most of them were women. So, so it comes, comes quite naturally. So, so it's the competencies and the, the fit, <laughs> fit to our company that matters, not, to, not exactly the, 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 if you're a man or, man or woman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's of, of course just... Uh, uh, not, not like let's say this, this kind of uh, when we talk about what kind of people are are in the m mm -hmm. work market. So, so is there is there because there, I think in recent years, especially there, there has a, has been a lot of discussion that there isn't many female applicants for for this sector. So, so that they 
they, they are not, not like uh, first interested in, in, in this sector. So, so of course, it's, it's really good, good to hear that this, this is not, not always the, the case that, that mm -hmm. there's, there's mainly, mainly men, men applicants and, and, and so on. And, and of course, uh, the, then, it's, then it's whatever kind of diversity is, 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 is always, I, I would say, welcome in, in companies because that's, that's, that's re as we saw, the key, key for solving these, these comp complex uh, problems. Yeah, and and we, when we are creating our new culture, we are, we are, we are very much working on the diversity and inclusion as well. There are, there are um, many projects um, going on at the moment and that, that will also be seen in our recruitments as well and how we kind of um, instruct our, our line managers to take that into account. And we participate in, in, in these uh, events, for example, Women in Tech, when, when, when possible. Yeah, yeah. So then uh, we have, let's say, talk about a lot uh, that, that Metsoototek and, and, and yeah, the raw materials, they, they have their, let's say, educational actions. And, and of course, university <laughs> representatives, they tend to have their own <laughs> also, and, and everything is, is more or less concentrated on education, but then maybe next time I would like to ask that how do you see, are the roles now changing? Because uh, let's say more and more it, it thinks that uh, also companies, they, they have their own programs and, and, and so on. And, and then, then there is, a, uh, let's say, yeah, the raw materials that, that are offering for lifelong learning. So, so which is definitely good since, since there is so much need for reskilling, upskilling and everything. But, but how do you see that? Is, is the, uh, let's say this sector changing or other roles changing. Is, is the universities doing still the same same, uh, uh, let's say tasks as as before, or or are we are we somehow transferring to to different kind of world? Maybe if, if Fabio starts. Yes, I, I think this is one of the main problems <laughs> we were facing while defining or supporting the the development of lifelong learning pro programs in this knowledge triangle perspective, because the academia sometimes, uh, or some of the university partners, were not willing to play this role of upskilling. Up they are, of, of course, focused on the new generation, on the research and uh, other other possibilities. Uh, so, so I see two, two issues. From one side, the, the interest, because not all the universities are so much interested to work actively on this. And on the other side, also the practical uh, difficulties they, they have to manage this kind of uh, uh, education. So we could so see for our partner that it, it was not easy to, to combine these two spirits, the professional education and the uh, students' education with research. But, uh, but I think that more and more universities are really now willing to, 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 to take part, uh, take a role in this uh, reshaping of the future workforce. But for sure that we could see uh, a lot of, uh, I wouldn't say resistance, but really the difficulty in, in doing this. Because of course every university has uh, own strategies, have funding, have a shortage of also of, uh, researchers and professors. So sometimes uh, they are limited. But, um, but in these years, I, th I could see a little bit of change. But maybe we should ask also the university partners here what they, what's your opinion? But uh, this is what we see from our partnership, uh, from our network, at least. Yeah, and this this will highlight, of of course, that we need to have this uh, communication and, and cooperation with each yeah. other, so that we can definitely better uh, define uh, what is the future and and future future roles. What are they now? And and of of course, as a university representative, I, I also uh, understand that, that, that it, it, is, it is challenging for universities since, since we have our own structures and, and are they now, need, do they need to be renewed or is, is there some, something that, that is not working for the world world that we are now facing that is changing so, so, so rapidly and, and universities, yeah. they, they tend to be, or, or let's say, uh, slowly moving, which is, of course, to some extent, it's a good, good part in society that, that the, let's say, the 
higher education institutes are, are not jumping around mm -hmm. that, that they, 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 they of course need to have a strong culture and, 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 and structures that are not that easily changed. Mm -hmm. if, if and, uh, maybe you know. if I can add, it, it's also another point which is important because we need to match the industry and the universities and we often realize that there's uh, a different way of speaking because the university has the, the knowledge, the university can upskill they can provide this knowledge. But sometimes they, they don't really understand what university, uh, well, what, sorry, industry requires. And the other way around, the industry knows that they need to upskill their talents, but they don't really know, or maybe they are not completely aware which will be the future talents they, they will be required. So sometimes there's also this little mismatch between these two components. So it's a... Uh, the providers of the future knowledge and the, let's say, customers, but also the, 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 the developers of the skills. So I don't know if you maybe <laughs> mm. have the same vision. Yeah, that's why I think it's very utmost important that the, the that they ha have the dialogue and they they discuss mm. and and uh, think uh, uh, give give each others knowledge what is going on both the industry and the universities yeah yeah i think this this is really maybe a good good uh, way to end our right round table discussion since our our time time is now now running out but it is is definitely o o also highlighting the fact that that we need we need more more uh, increased cooperation with industry and academia and also research and, and, and technology organizations so 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 to just to somehow uh, to uh, let's say answer to these challenges that that we are facing so so it is it is really really good that that now now we have also this this arena for for this wider discussion and, and it was really good to see that there is we have we are receiving more and more participants uh, for the, for this, this second year, so so it, it really tells tells that this this kind of arena is is needed and actions are needed that that we can uh, better better answer to these challenges. So at this point, I would of course like to thank all the keynote speakers uh, for for their for their presentations and all, and all the other other presenters also, and, and of of course of course the representatives from this roundtable discussions so so thank you very much and and i would like to remind all all the people to now to join the discussion groups and and, and then i would say the uh, best part of, of the of the of the workshop is definitely also, also there that that we can we can collect collect the different views and, and and then then have a really really wide view on on this on this like landscape on this sector so at, at this point, I would like to thank you for your attention and, and, and hope to see you also on the next day. Thank you.